Hello folks, welcome to the last mini lecture of chapter 2, nucleic acids. About time we got chapter 2 out of the way. Alright, so nucleic acids, similar to carbohydrates and proteins, are built on the monomer to polymer system, which means nucleic acids are thousands to millions of monomers actually, because when we talk about human chromosomes, some of them are 250 million base pairs long. So. Nucleic acids are built in the monomer system, just like carbohydrates are built in the monomer system, just like proteins are built in the monomer system. Recall that lipids were not. Lipids aren't built in this monomer to polymer system. So what is the monomer of a nucle nucleic acid? It is a nucleotide. Here's the word nucleotide. All nucleotides have a, a similar base structure, and that is this. They have a nitrogenous base, but there's different flavors of nitrogenous bases we'll talk about. They have a sugar, and it is a pentose sugar. Um, however, depending on which nucleic acid it is, it might be a ribose sugar or a deoxyribose sugar, but they're both pentoses, and it has a phosphate group. This is a nucleotide. Now, let's ta start talking about some of the differences. The nitrogenous base could be one of five nitrogenous bases. It could be adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, or uracil. Now here's the deal. Adenine and guanine are purines, that word right there, which means they have a double ring structure. You can see the two rings in both of them. All right, So they're purines. Uh, they are found in both RNA and DNA. Adenine and guanine are found in both, both of the main nucleic acids, RNA, ribonucleic acid, and DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. The other nitrogenous bases could be cytosine, and oh, by the way, the, the rest are pyrimidines, single ring structures, not double ring structures. Cytosine, that's found in RNA and DNA. Thymine, it's only found in DNA. You don't find thymine in RNA. It's a single ring, ring structure pyrimidine, but you don't find it in RNA, DNA only. And then lastly, uracil. It's only found in RNA. It's not found in DNA. It's a pyrimidine that's only found in RNA. So the three nitrogenous bases that are common to DNA and RNA are adenine, guanine, and cytosine. And then DNA contains a fourth one, thymine, whereas RNA doesn't have that thymine fourth one. But RNA contains a fourth one, uracil, whereas DNA doesn't have the uracil. hope that makes sense. So a nucleotide structure is a nitrogenous base of pentose sugar, ribose or deoxyribose, and a phosphate group. We'll talk about DNA first, and we'll look at this video of uh, uh, the DNA structure. It'll probably go into some details that we haven't covered yet, but you could go back and play the video again when we get through the mini-lecture. The structure of the DNA molecule was first inferred by James Watson and Francis Crick, based primarily on X-ray crystallography data collected by Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin and chemical analysis of base composition of DNA conducted by Erwin Shargaff. The key features of the structure are its right-handed double helical structure. Each helix consists of an alternating sugar phosphate backbone with nitrogen bases projecting toward the interior of each helix. One complete 360-degree turn of the helix covers 10 bases of length and equals 3.4 nanometers in physical distance along the axis of the molecule. The width of the double helix is 2 nanometers. The nucleotide bases are attached inside each backbone of the molecule so that the nucleotides in one helix or strand are hydrogen bonded to the bases in the other helix or strand. The hydrogen bonds hold the two strands of the double helix together. An adenine in one strand is always paired with a thymine in the other strand, and a guanine in one strand is always paired with a cytosine in the other strand. Note that guanine-cytosine base pairs form three hydrogen bonds, while adenine-thymine base pairs form two hydrogen bonds. This makes guanine-cytosine base pairs more stable than adenine-thymine base pairs. Nucleotide pairing between strands also allows the sequence in one strand to determine the sequence in the complementary strand. The two ends of a strand are not identical. Note that on one end of each strand, a three-prime hydroxyl group of the deoxyribose sugar is not involved in the backbone, or we say it's free. 
while at the other end of the same strand, the 5' prime hydroxyl group of the deoxyribose sugar at the end is free or may contain a phosphate that is free and not bonded to another deoxyribose sugar. This dissimilarity of the two ends of a strand creates the ability to uniquely distinguish each end of the strand. Because of this polarity of each strand, we can see that the two strands of DNA are oriented in opposite directions, or we say that they are antiparallel. In three-dimensional space, the two helices are not equally spaced along the axis of the molecule such that a major groove and a minor groove are created by the asymmetric spacing of the antiparallel helix backbones. The major groove and minor groove play important roles in the binding of proteins that regulate gene transcription. All right, folks, so that's, that's DNA in a nutshell, but it, there was a lot of uh, architecture you don't have to memorize. For example, I, I'm not going to want you to know the distance along the strand that, that 10 bases give you, which is 3.4 nanometers. I'm not going to, I don't care about that. So you don't need to know that. You do have to know that DNA is double-stranded helix. You do have to know that a purine always binds a pyrimidine, hydrogen bonds in the center. And specifically, an adenine always binds a thymine, an adenine is a purine and a thymine is a pyrimidine. And a guanine always binds a cytosine. A guanine is a purine and a cytosine is a pyrimidine. Uh, this anti-parallel nature of the DNA double helix is going to be important. And I'm going to talk about it more in a second. So I won't try to talk to you via the movie on that. So that's about it for, for an overview of the DNA. So let's talk about this endedness right now. Uh, so first of all... Let me just back way up to you know elementary school. These two lines are parallel. These two lines are perpendicular. Well, roughly. Obviously, I didn't do it perfectly. So these two lines are perpendicular. I try to do a better job. Now these two lines are parallel, but I need another word. I mean, they're certainly not perpendicular. They're parallel, but they're pointing in different directions. So I need another word that says to me they're parallel but pointing in different directions. And the word we use is anti-parallel. All right? So they are parallel, but they're pointing in different directions. Now, DNA is anti-parallel. And all that means is that there's a free prime, there's a free 3 prime OH sticking off the tail of that molecule, but not this one. Not the one parallel to it, but what's sticking off of here? A five prime phosphate. So see, the heads don't line up. Matter of fact, they line up head to tail, and that's why we call it anti-parallel. And that does become important uh, in medicine when we talk about things like DNA replication and telomeres and telomerase. Telomerase is uh, an enzyme that that catalyzes a reaction at the end of a DNA molecule. Uh, but the important thing is this. There's medicines in the FDA pipeline right now that knock out telomerase that are potential cancer treatment drugs. Or not potential, they are cancer treatment drugs. Whether they'll be approved or not, we'll see. So there is medical importance to this architecture or anti-parallel nature of the uh, DNA molecule. It is true, when you see it written here, that guanine and cytosine have three hydrogen bonds and adenine and thymine only have two hydrogen bonds. That is true. Uh, it's, it's just the nature of the organic molecule, why they form those three hydrogen bonds versus two hydrogen bonds. Typically speaking, DNA is double-stranded, as you see here. And typically speaking, RNA is single-stranded. So I could say this is RNA. I could speculate it's RNA. Why? Because it's single-stranded. But secondly is because it contains uracil. See, DNA doesn't have uracil. And likewise, RNA doesn't have thymine, and DNA has thymine. The other big, big difference is this. The sugar in DNA is a deoxyribose. In fact, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Whereas, the sugar in RNA, and I know you're not sh we're not showing you the sugar there, but the sugar in RNA is ribose. So, RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So, the sugars are different. There's some slight differences in the, in the nitrogenous bases, mainly the T and the U. 
and DNA is typically double-stranded and RNA is typically single-stranded. All right, so that's nucleic acids in a nutshell. This is a comparison of RNA with DNA. So you can see that. You can go ahead and read, read your way down through that and see it. All right. Now, ATP is the universal currency of energy. Guaranteed test question. When I say universal currency of energy, I mean, what the heck do I mean? Universal currency of energy. Well, let's talk about what a currency is first. If, uh, if I had a uh, car to sell you, you want to buy my car, I could be selling it to you for different currencies. I could say, hey, I'll give you my car. I want uh, two Hereford bulls and an Angus bull and three sheep. And that would be the currency. Or I could say to you, I want $5,000. And the, the, US Ameri the U.S. dollar would be the currency. Well, the currency of energy in a cell, the, the molecule that is the primary source of energy for all kinds of events, is ATP. Now, you're going to say to me, no, I eat an apple for my energy. Well, you eat an apple to catabolize it just to make ATP. You actually change the energy of the chemical bonds in the apple to energy of chemical bonds in ATP. And then when you want to contract a muscle or pump an ion or other molecule or, at, or, or something like that, when you want to do something in your cell, you utilize the ATP to do it. And then you have to eat another apple to make more ATP to contract another muscle. So ATP is our currency of energy in our cells. And the word universal means every swinging cell on the planet uses it. From the lowliest, lowliest bacteria, which, by the way, I don't actually think bacteria are lowly. If we were to have a massive global uh, nuclear holocaust, bacteria would survive. We wouldn't. But I'm just putting it out there that single-celled organisms use ATP as well as humans. And, and everyone in between, too. So ATP is universal currency of energy. ATP is a nucleotide. It's a nucleotide triphosphate. So you're going to say, well, well, let me remind you what a nucleotide is. Let's go back and look at a nucleotide. Here's a nucleotide. Nitrogenous base, sugar phosphate. Okay, let's make sure ATP has that. Nitrogenous base has to be adenine because it's adenosine triphosphate. It's not guanosine triphosphate. It's not thymidine triphosphate. It's not cytosine triphosphate. It's not uridine triphosphate. So it's not... When we talk about the nitrogenous bases, it's not G, although GTP does exist. By the way, GTP exists. CTP exists. TTP exists. UTP exists. These, these guys certainly exist. But it's not GTP or CTP or TTP or UTP. It's ATP. Therefore, the nitrogenous base better be A. It is. There's that name. It better have a sugar. It does. Now, question. Is ATP deoxy ATP with a deoxy ribose? Or is the universal, because that exists. That certainly exists. Or is the universal currency of energy ATP with a ribose? And the answer is ATP has a ribose. It's not deoxy ATP. It's ATP. And there's your phosphate group. So there's your nucleotide. And this nucleotide is called adenosine monophosphate. Now, there's two additional phosphates hooked to it. If you hook one additional phosphate, you have adenosine diphosphate. If you hook the third additional phosphate to it, you have adenosine triphosphate. These bonds right here, right here, are written in this curly fashion because they're labile, opposite of stable. They are unstable. And it, although it always, always, always requires energy to break a bond, when you hydrolyze these bonds, it requires energy to hydrolyze them, but you get more energy out of hydrolyzing those bonds than you do than it took to break them. So these are high-energy bonds that when they're hydrolyzed, you get a lot of energy out of that. In fact, you get 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Now, that means if I were to hydrolyze 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of ATP, I would get 7.3 kilocalories out of it. 
That's what a mole means, is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So that's how much energy. And by the way, that's 7.3 kilocalories per mole for just that bond. I'm not even talking about, so let me erase this stuff. That 7.3 kilocalories per mole is only hydrolyzing that bond. I'm not even talking about hydrolyzing that bond right there at this point. So this ATP molecule is a universal currency of energy, and we'll talk about it a lot when we do muscle contraction and some other things. All right, that's ATP. This is the classes of inorganic and organic molecules, and we're going to talk about what the cells do with these guys. You know, what's the turnover? Do they store them? Do they not store them? So let's look at inorganic first. Uh, our inorganics is our acids, our base, and our electrolytes, or salts. Acids are anything that donate an H plus molecule. Bases are anything that donate an OH minus molecule or accept an H plus, by the way. Uh, we have these dissolved gases. In, uh, we have CO2. We have O2. We have nitrogen, but it does very little. For, I mean, we don't do anything with it. It's 78% of our atmosphere, but it enters our body and leaves our body and doesn't do anything. But these are some gases. Unfortunately, we do have some carbon monoxide that enters our body a little bit. doesn't hurt us too much. Hopefully, we keep it down to a little bit. Uh, we have, we have um, organic molecules, my four biological macromolecules. Those are my organic molecules. Remember, the monomers of carbohydrates are monosaccharides. Remember, the monomers of proteins are amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids. Remember, the monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. And the lipids aren't built, built on the monomer polymer system. So there you go for uh, the different compounds in the body. Now look at the turnover type. If you, look at, if you look at protein in the liver, the liver goes through protein fast. It takes it in, it breaks it down, it builds its own proteins, and the total protein in the liver is turned over about once a week. But a muscle cell doesn't turn over the protein that fast. The protein in a muscle cell lasts about a month. Not a week, but a month. And that's a good thing. You don't want to be breaking down your muscle cell protein all the time. You do. I mean, there's turnover to it. You're, you're always building new and breaking down what's there. You're, you're doing that. But the muscle protein is much more stable and lasts longer. All right. Now, there's no proteins in the neurons. And, well, there is, but not a significant amount of proteins in the neurons or fat cells, so we won't compare them. Let's look at cholesterol because um, I could look at enzymes here. However, there's no enzymes down in these cells to compare. So let's look at cholesterol. The liver, the cholesterol lasts about a week. All right. In the neuron, the cholesterol lasts. Look at that. That cholesterol lasts 100 plus days. That's a long time. Now, in a fat cell, there is cholesterol in a fat cell. It didn't list it. It depends on your state of metabolism. If you're running marathons, the lipids in your fat cells will be turned over very, very quickly. If you're not running marathons, then the lipids in your fat cells wouldn't be turned over quickly. Now look at phospholipids. It's not like I can compare the phospholipids in a neuron to other phospholipids because they're not listed here. All right? But I want to show you something. The phospholipids in a neuron last almost a year. They're very stable. Whereas the phospholipids in other cells, I will tell you, don't last that long. They turn over much more frequently. Uh, neurons don't... Uh, th th We'll go into the details of neurons, but sometimes they're insulated with myelin and things like this, and that's that lends, lends to the stability of the phospholipids. All right. Lastly, let's look at glycogen. The glycogen, and this is metabolic. This the state of metabolism. It has a lot to do with this right here. The glycogen in the liver uh, will last a couple days, and that depends on your metabolic activity. Are you running a marathon? Or are you sitting, watching a game, eating potato chips? So the glycogen, the turnover time is one to two days in the liver. And then in the muscle cell, it might last a day. I mean, it may last a day, but it'll be turned over more quickly because the muscle cell is contracting. So you can see we do store glycogen in both our liver and our muscle cell, and the muscle cells will burn that glycogen for, for energy. They burn the glycogen to make ATP. This is pretty cool. Enzymes right here. Uh, some enzymes last one hour. 
Some enzymes last several days. Some enzymes last a lifetime, depending on the organism. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, because I know somebody who had a disease called leishmaniasis. Picked it up in the Middle East. Okay? This person picked up leishmaniasis in the Middle East. Now, leishmaniasis is a parasite. It's a worm. So, lesh, leishmani is a worm. All right? Now, there's an enzyme, there, there's a glycolytic enzyme that leishmaniasis has that humans have. Leishmaniasis is a eukaryote, uh, lesh, the leishmani worm is a eukaryote just like humans are. There's a glycolytic enzyme, and when leishmani makes these glycolytic, this glycolytic enzyme, it'll make several versions, several copies of it. It'll make several of them, but they last the lifetime of the worm. Humans make the same enzyme. But they only la but that enzyme only lasts a couple days, and they make more of it. Well, what's the treatment for leishmaniasis? The treatment is uh, a pentavalent antimonial, so it's antimony. It's a, a metal on the periodic table, and it's a pentavalent antimonial because it has five things attached to it. All right. So you take this drug, this pentavalent anti antimonial or antimony. You take this heavy metal, and in the heavy metal attaches to the enzyme and keeps it from working. You're going to say, well, you just stopped your own enzyme from working. Yeah, we did. But the human cells make more of the enzyme later on. In a couple days, it'll make more. Whereas the worm makes that enzyme one time in its entire life. When that worm is born, it makes that, well, probably made it before it was born. That worm made that enzyme, and that's it. That's all it has. It never turns that gene on again. So when the antimony binds the enzyme of the worm, it knocks out that enzyme, and that worm dies because it'll never make that enzyme again. Whereas when the antimony binds the enzyme of the human, it'll slow down cellular metabolism briefly for a couple days, but, but then the human's making more of that enzyme. And it'll have some enzyme floating around with no antimony hooked to it. So the cell doesn't die, its metabolism just slows down a little bit. And this is the treatment for leishmaniasis. It's important to treat leishmaniasis because as long as it's cutaneous, cutaneous leishmaniasis leads to the Baghdad boil. That's what they call it. Baghdad boil. Not pleasant to look at, but not deadly. But if it becomes visceral, if it becomes visceral leishmaniasis, it kills you. So you have to treat it when you have cutaneous leishmaniasis. You don't want to take a chance of it going visceral. So there's a there's turnover rates and how we use turnover rates as a mode of treatment. We exploit the fact that some path some pathogens like this parasite has a lifelong enzyme, whereas the human has a short turnaround time for the same enzyme. All right, I'll see you in chapter three.